So, without further ado, uh, let's meet the three major party candidates for governor in alphabetical order. Democrat, Mark Dayton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Republican, Tom Emmer. Independence Party candidate, Tom Horner. So there are your candidates. Uh, one other thing, if, if I may, before we get started. This is the 26th debate that these gentlemen have participated in since the primary in August. 26th one where all three have been, been on stage. That's more than two a week. Now, in most states, you're lucky if your candidates for governor have one debate, two debates, maybe three debates if they really go wild and crazy. We've had a chance to hear from these candidates over two dozen times at length in remarkable detail on the major issues facing the state of Minnesota. I think that the state of Minnesota has been very well served by these gentlemen, and I think they all deserve a rich round of applause. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. All right, having built them up, let's tear them down. <laughs> Just kidding. I wanted to start. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to start, gentlemen, with a, a couple of questions. One for each of you about this Minnesota Public Radio Humphrey Institute poll that came out last week. Not the horse race poll. This was the uh, the one that asked about uh, attitudes, Minnesotans' attitudes about taxes and spending. Uh, one of the findings, uh, Representative Emmer, was that two-thirds of the people surveyed said they want to see higher taxes. Two-thirds. Uh, does that give you any second thoughts about your position opposing any tax increase? No, actually, Gary, it does not. And I, it, the other part of it was they want to see less spending and they want to see uh, less services, which I found interesting as well when you talk about this survey. We don't know, the three of us, and maybe uh, my two colleagues have actually uh, studied the questions that were asked in the survey, but a lot of times you get the response based on the, uh, on the question. I would say this, to those people that are talking about higher taxes, like my colleagues, uh, it, it really isn't a matter of not having enough revenue. It's a, it's a matter of not setting our priorities and making sure the government purchases the services within the revenues we have. I give the example all the time. You got the state of Minnesota that spends close to $60 billion every two years. Uh, the state of Colorado is roughly the same geographic size, and I believe it's within about 0.5% of our population. Granted, nothing's apples to apples, but the state of Colorado spends closer to $40 billion every two years. And again, it's a matter of making sure that the resources we have are purchasing the services that we expect. And that's going to be important for the next governor, next legislature, to explain to people this is what we're doing. And again, I'm the only one that's put out a budget that balances the state's budget within the additional revenues that we're going to have, about 7 to 8% in more revenues in the next two years. And I think mm -hmm. that's what the, the public expects. They want you to provide the services within the revenue the government but has. Does it give you any pause that perhaps a large number of Minnesotans actually want and support tax increases? Actually, no, Gary. Again, I'll say it. Minnesotans want good government. They want efficient government. Okay. Uh, right now, they've been led to believe by uh, the same mantra that we hear even from my colleagues, that you've got to raise billions of dollars of new taxes or we're going to cut your services. That's not true. It's time to start redesigning government to deliver those services in an efficient manner and within the resources that we have. Once we start doing that, let people keep more of their resources and start growing jobs again in the state of Minnesota. That's how you get your economy moving. Move it again. Tom, Tom Horner, uh, same poll, says that the, all these people who say they like higher taxes are not fond of raising the sales tax. They're all support, not all of them, but most of them, vast majority prefer raising the income tax. Do you have any second thoughts about your plan? No, because I do think that we need tax reform. Um, and what we have seen is that when Minnesotans had the opportunity to vote on a tax in 2008, they voted overwhelmingly to raise the, the sales tax, to protect the, the environment, to, to protect our natural assets, um, to invest in the arts. I mean, it, it led the, the, the ballot. So I think what we really see is that when Minnesota 
Minnesotans believe that the money is going to be used for purposes that they believe in, they will support tax reform. And that's what I've proposed. You know, what we see in the polls is when you ask them, do you want to get a free ride by cutting spending for the poor? Do you want to get a free ride by taxing 4% and everybody else gets off scot-free? Of course, everybody in a poll is going to say, sure, don't tax me, tax the guy behind the tree. When they actually have had to vote on it, when Senator Dayton last ran for governor, he supported an expansion of sales tax. When you look at Democrats in the Senate, they've supported proposals closer to mine. The business-led tax reform commission appointed by Governor Pawlenty ended up where, where I did. And so I think as Minnesotans understand what I'm really proposing is reduce the sales tax, cut it, so that when you're buying big ticket items, those items that really affect a family's budget, appliances, furniture, you're going to pay less. And then we will broaden the base, but do it in a way that's fair. I think that's what, what Minnesotans are looking for with the leadership to say we then will spend the money in a way that you can trust, in a way that goes for the good purposes that Minnesotans want. Mark Dayton, the other half of that poll, as uh, Representative Emmer pointed out, the other half of that poll found that a majority of those surveyed uh, favor, actually favor smaller government and reduced services, uh, not the more expansive government that you've talked about, really. Uh, any second thoughts about uh, the promises, the goals that you've laid out in the campaign? Well, I'm not proposing expanded uh, state government, Gary. I, in fact, I'll work with the uh, private sector uh, advisors to look at how we can uh, find greater administrative efficiencies and savings that way. But 95% you know, of the state budget goes half to uh, education. 30% uh, to health and human services, 9% uh, to public safety, 5% uh, to 5% uh, public safety, 9% to property tax relief and uh, local government aids, and 3% to the debt service. And the reality is, you know, we're going to have 124,000 more people living in Minnesota uh, over the next uh, two years, and we're going to have uh, 14,000 more students in our public K-12 schools. So, you know, if you look at some of these increases that Representative Emmer refers to, the reality is those those dollars are going to help people. They're going to help school children to prevent having more districts go to four-day school weeks, to reduce the overcrowding in our classrooms, to work with an aging population. You know, 88% of our health and human services budget goes to the elderly and to children and to people with disabilities. So, you know, these dollars are translated into uh, services for people, and they're the reflective of the values of Minnesotans. And that's why we build a great state, because Minnesotans recognize we, our future does depend on education. They recognize that the elderly or those with disabilities are, are people who often need, need help. And so I just want to continue those essential services. Is it possible... <laughs> is it possible that all three of you are going to have a really tough time getting your programs, whatever those programs are, through the Minnesota legislature? It doesn't appear to be. We're talking to the legislative leaders the other day, and it doesn't appear like there is a big appetite for raising the income tax on the wealthiest. It doesn't appear to be much of an appetite for uh, expanding the sales tax to clothing doesn't appear to be much of an appetite for cutting six billion dollars in state spending so whoever gets elected here how are you going to get your program through the legislature mark Dayton. well the, the the key of course is that we need a job creation in minnesota as we do in this country and uh, you know that will increase revenues by more people working and paying taxes. Until that happens, the reality is for every dollar of revenue you don't raise, you have to cut a dollar in spending. So you know, there'll be 201 legislators, each elected uh, in their own right, properly so, and they'll have their own opinions about the, the governor's proposal. But the bottom line is the end of the session, uh, all, both the legislature and the governor have to meet a constitutional requirement to balance the budget. And so there'll be a, a negotiation, there'll be a collaboration, and uh, that'll be part of the process that if I'm governor, I'll certainly be engaged in. Tom Emmer? Well, no, I, I think that we have the best opportunity to pass what I'm talking about. First, Gary, we've got to start, uh, your question is based on the premises that we, uh, we got to cut $6 billion in spending. We keep saying it that way, and my colleagues keep talking about 5 to $6 billion that we're in deficit as if we're cutting spending. The next governor, the next legislature in this state will actually have 7 to 8% 
more revenue to spend. That's almost $3 billion more than current general fund spending in the state of Minnesota. Uh, so let's start from the premise that we have to operate within the additional revenues that we're going to have. And I proposed to get jobs growing again in this state immediately. I proposed reducing the corporate franchise tax by a point in each of the next two years. That puts uh, approximately $360 million in the hands of our employers to start making capital investments and hiring again proposed a 10% exclusion on gross earnings for small businesses, those S corporations and LLCs, those people that actually file personal income tax returns, not corporate returns, expanding the angel investment tax credit, the research and development tax credit, uh, reducing commercial property taxes. Gary, these things have bipartisan support in the legislature. Uh, Mr. Horner's sales tax proposal has a couple of people that have proposed it in the past. It has absolutely no chance of getting through the legislature. Legislature. And Senator Dayton's uh, proposal actually got seven votes out of the House of Representatives last year. So I would say the plan that we provided is not only balanced and living within its means, but it provides instant incentives for growing jobs in this state that enjoy support from both Republicans and Democrats. Tom Horner. Gary, I think you look at a person's track record. I think you look at the experience. I think you look at the people who have actually brought Democrats, Republicans, independents together to get things done. So you have uh, Tom Emmer, who has spent six years in the legislature fighting Democrats and Republicans, who takes a position uh, that is very, very far to the right, the most conservative position, even among Republicans, just to do everything by cutting spending. As we've talked about, Mark Dayton has spent 35 years running for office after office after office, serves one term, and then he's out. How does that build any kind of, of coalition, any kind of support? Where's the track record of getting things done? And then in the campaign today, takes a position very, very far to the left. Only, as Tom Emmer said, only a handful of, of people who would even acknowledge the need to, to uh, come anywhere close to, to what he's proposing. How do you build any kind of coalition? There is the problem. It's why every former governor who has endorsed, the people who have been there, who understand it, who know how to get things done, have said, I'm the candidate who can build these coalitions, who can build the bridges. And I do disagree with, with Tom Emmer um, that, that there's not support there. Quite the contrary. It's not just a handful of people. It's the chair of the Senate Tax Committee. It's the people who um, are going to lead the job creation in Minnesota who have endorsed the kind of proposal I'm talking about. If you uh, just tuned in, the three major party candidates for governor are on stage at the Fitzgerald Theater. I'm Gary Eichen, and they are here for a final debate, one last final debate before Tuesday's election. Let's go to the audience here at the Fitzgerald Theater for some questions for the uh, candidates. Curtis Gilbert. Yes, Gary, I'm here with Bonnie. She lives in Brooklyn Center. I should note that she's wearing a Mark Dayton t-shirt, uh, but she's got a question for all the candidates, and another important thing is that she's a special ed teacher. Um, the special ed is often uh, pitted against general ed for funds, and I'm wondering if you guys have um, plans to meet special ed mandates and also um, be fair to the regular ed, um, general education programs. Tom Emmer, you want to go first? Absolutely. Bonnie, I think uh, one of the problems with our special education funding is that it's not uh, a set amount. It's based on number of students. It, it gives the wrong incentives, and it's not, uh, it, it's, it's not something that we can count on from year to year, uh, and it creates this uh, imbalance. I think uh, first off, first and foremost, when we talk about our K-12 education system, we've got to talk about reform from top to bottom. We've got to talk about making sure that the uh, roughly $14 billion that we propose should go into K-12 education next in the next two years, that that is, it allows professional educators and administrators to put those monies where they have to go, where they can get the highest value for the return, instead of constantly letting the union uh, boss, which would be Tom Dewar, stop these reforms and keep us from putting the ample resources that we have where the greatest need is and where we can get the greatest value. Mark Dayton. Well, first, Bonnie, thank you for your, your dedication as a special ed teacher. I have a young relative who's autistic, and I know what a challenge that is. And you know, that's why I tried seven times in the six years I was in the U.S. Senate to get the federal government to meet its uh, 
failed promise to provide the funding for 40% of the cost of special education. Uh, that would have been $250 million of additional funding for all the schools in Minnesota and would have helped all the, of the students by funding that unfunded mandate. And I will continue to work with the Minnesota congressional delegation if I'm governor. Uh, Representative John Klein's made the case that this is really the, ought to be the priority for the federal government to fulfill that uh, unfunded mandate. I agree with him, and I will do everything I possibly can to, to get that funding so that we're not forcing uh, schools to make those decisions among students. Tom Horner. Well. This is one more area where we need to start with the outcomes that we have to achieve. Instead of continuing to create all these silos where we're going to treat special education that way, we're going to treat gifted education this way, we're going to treat early childhood education another way, we really need to be smart about it and start with how do we make sure that every child coming out of our schools is prepared for the next step in his or her life whether it's into the military, into a job, into more education. How are we preparing them to succeed and then figure out what it is that we need to do to, to get that child there? And so certainly in special education, do we need to make some changes? Do we need to focus our resources without question? But it also starts back at early childhood education, at ECFE, the early childhood and family education, making sure that we have children coming into school prepared for success so that they can succeed whatever their ability level, that we're challenging them, that we're helping them achieve their highest aspirations, their highest abilities as students in schools that work for all children. Quick, uh, quick follow-up on education, if I may, and a qu quick response. Will schools, uh, next, for the next two years, have enough new money to cover the added costs of increased enrollment and inflation? Mark Dayton? Well, I, you know, the, my, the, the budget I'm uh, supporting would provide for enough money, and this is coming from the state's uh, economic forecast, to fund the, the, at the current formula level the funding for the additional 14,000 students that are expected in the schools, which is why when Representative Ember says he's going to provide just the same level of funding as uh, the state and the federal stimulus money combined for the next biennium as for this biennium, and there are 14,000 more students than on a per student basis, that, that results in a, in a cut. I will continue that level of funding and I will do my utmost to repay the shift. Tom Horner? Yes, if we move the money from administration into the classroom to make sure that the classroom is our priority, and if we're willing to be bold to do some of the reforms that I've proposed to make sure that we're allowing teachers to teach, that we have great principals in every school, that we're starting children, uh, prepared for success as they enter kindergarten. Tom Emmer? The answer is yes, as long as you're willing to take on Tom Dewar, the, uh, the union boss for Education Minnesota. And I'll tell you, uh, Senator, you, you just played that typical political game that people do. The state's commitment to education, the K-12 system, is uh, roughly $13.3 billion right now. We've added $500 million to the budget that we propose, so almost $14 billion. But uh, Senator Dayton likes to point out that we're not including the stimulus. Well, you can't guarantee anything from the federal government right now. That's not responsible. Not only is the uh, concept that you proposed, which is making promises about, I'm just going to keep increasing funding every year without any plan for where it's going to come from because we're not growing jobs under your plan. We're pushing them out of the state. You add this federal stimulus money, which there's no guarantee that the federal government is going to be able to honor any of these commitments going forward. If we're going to be responsible for Minnesota, we have to do it with Minnesota dollars and see later what the federal government is going to be able to do. Mark Dayton, do you want to... Mark Gaten, you want to respond? Hey, Representative Emmer, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. In this biennium current, the state's paying $13.3 billion, and the federal stimulus money is providing $500 million for a total of $13.8 billion. Your budget for the next biennium calls for the same amount, all from the state, $13.8 billion. And there are going to be 14,000 more students in our K-12 public schools. So on a per-student basis, that's a real cut. Yeah, and Gary, Tom Emmer. On a state commitment basis, it's not a cut at all, it's an increase, and I'll just point out to Senator Dayton that if you're going to be beholden to the union boss, Tom Dewar, you're not going to be able to give, you are not going to be able to give our professional educators and our administrators the ability to use the funds that we have in the way that we've just talked about, getting more okay. of it into the classroom, making sure that our teachers have the ability to teach, making sure that our administrators have the ability to get the highest value. It's got to be in the best interest of the student, uh, Senator Dayton, not in the best interest of Tom, Tom Horner. 
please. And I'll just say, if you continue to draw lines with teachers, if you continue to just say that spending is the only answer, how do you move anywhere in the future? I mean, this is just the same kind of debate we've had for the last eight years. We need a new discussion for the next four years. Let's go back to the audience, uh, Nancy Liebens. Gary, I'm here with Twyla from St. Paul. She's wearing a button for Emmer, and she has a question about health care. Yes, as you all know, the um, health care reform passed in March, and really it is, it requires it puts a lot of power at the governor level and at the state legislature for implementing it. I'm concerned about the provisions in the bill which require everyone to buy an insurance product which is approved by the government and no other, as well as the um, provisions that will, I believe, disrupt the patient-doctor relationship and put the government in charge of looking at all our medical records and making our decisions. So I'd like to know, as governors, whether you are willing to commit to not implementing Obamacare or if you are committing to go forward with it. Thank you. Tom Horner. Yes, well, and thank you, Twyla. I know that you spend a lot of time on this issue. Um, and, and sometimes I think you have raised good issues. Other times, I think you just unnecessarily raise the red flag of alarm. So let me talk about health care reform. I think there are challenges, problems, weaknesses in the federal health care reform. But it is exactly for that reason that Minnesota better be a leader in figuring out how to leverage the national health reform for lower cost, higher quality care in Minnesota, building on what already works in Minnesota. And we're going to have to be bold and innovative. We're going to have to do things differently. Let me give you an example. The Minnesota Department of Health decided that they needed to reduce the cost of low-income children with asthma. They created a terrific program to help identify the triggers of asthma attacks uh, that, that were sending kids into the emergency room. By working with the families, working with the kids, they were able to reduce costs by an average of $2,000 per child per year. But more than that, more than that, they were able to reduce school absences by an average of seven days per child per year. Over the course of a 12-year academic career, that's half of a school year. There's the achievement gap. There's lower health care costs. There's innovation if we look at health care from a Minnesota perspective, from a community perspective, from how do we do things better and differently, not just how were we doing things the last four years. Tom Emmer, uh, implementing the federal health care law. I think it's a, uh, it's a mistake. I think uh, I, I've actually authored the Minnesota uh, uh, Health Care Freedom Act, which would amend Minnesota's constitution to provide that the government can never tell us what decisions we have to make with our health care. I think it's a complete mistake. I think it's a mistake to believe that government can somehow do uh, make our health care decisions better than we can, uh, or uh, to suggest that uh, turning this over to the federal government or even the state government is going to allow us more innovation and allow us to be bold. Uh, it, it's not the right answer. We have an election uh, on Tuesday, and I know that some uh, candidates, it seems like half of the candidates in con Congress, uh, running for Congress, are now running against the Federal Health Care Reform Act, and uh, that's mostly Democrats. So I don't think think that uh, it, it's uh, got a future in terms of uh, it, the way it was passed. I think as we go forward, if we're going to reform Minnesota's health care system, we have to lead. That's true. But the way you do it is you don't turn it over to the federal government. The way you do it is you decouple health care insurance from employment so that individuals can deduct their health care insurance premiums just like any employer does now. Two, you give individuals more control over their ability to, to design health care insurance products and you allow them start to shopping to shop one of the 1,300 uh, approved uh, products across this country, and that you bring uh, market forces in, that'll drive costs down without destroying the quality of the health care offered in this state. Mark Dayton. Well, I think there's a lot of fear-mongering about uh, you know, this plan as it uh, will unfold in the future, and uh, let's look at what's uh, happened so far as a result. Young people up to the age of 26 can be covered under their parents' health plans. That means young people who are still in school uh, have that health coverage that many of them wouldn't have otherwise. You cannot deny uh, coverage to children based on pre-existing conditions. Uh, preventative procedures like mammograms and colonoscopies cannot be required uh, require a copay. 
So these are, these are positive steps that benefit Minnesotans and, and Americans. And you know, not, I will, if I'm governor, not allow anything to come between a patient-doctor relationship and the right of every Minnesotan to determine who they want their doctors to be. But so many Minnesotans today, because they can't afford health insurance or they can't afford the cost of health care, even with insurance because of the deductibles and co-pays, they don't have any relationship with the doctor at all. And the goal ought to be for this society to provide every person in this country with affordable, quality health care. Wanted to give, okay, wanted to give each of the uh, candidates a chance to, uh, after all these debates, <laughs> they've, they've heard a lot from the other candidates, want to give them a chance to follow up and ask a question of each of the, uh, the other candidates. And Mark Dayton, would you begin, please, with a question for Tom Emmer? Well, Representative Emmer, you and your proposal will cut on a per pupil basis the, the state funding for uh, school children. You're going to cut the funding for higher education considerably. And yet, despite those cuts for education, your budget does not require people making a million, five million, ten million dollars a year to pay one dollar in higher income taxes. How can you justify that, that trade off? Well, first off, uh, mine would, because uh, unlike your proposal, mine will grow jobs in the state of Minnesota. The more jobs you grow, not only will the, the new uh, people that are working start to pay taxes, but you know what? The new businesses, uh, those people that you seem to want to drive out of this state, they will also pay more in taxes. So to suggest that we don't want to, it always sounds good, Senator Dayton, to say we're going to tax this group or that group because it always sounds good when somebody else is going to pay your way, but that's not the way it works. Uh, you're going to tax everybody in this state and you've provided a budget that frankly has a huge billion dollar gap. And you keep talking about how, well, maybe I'll use the shift, even though you said earlier uh, in one of our debates or even uh, publicly, uh, I'm repaying uh, the shift and I'm putting more money in K-12 education, no excuses, no exceptions. And yet we come up here and you talk about maybe I'll fill the billion dollar gap with the, uh, the by not paying the shift, we'll see what happens with that. Here's the, here's the reality. Uh, when we talk about per pupil funding, we've got to make sure that we start making decisions and incorporating reforms that are in the best interest of the pupil, the student, okay. and, and their family, as opposed to the best interest of the union leadership. Second, when you talk about higher education, okay. yeah, I am asking higher education, Gary, to move into the 21st century, but don't talk to kids about raising tuition 10% every time when they can't get their own house in order. The University of Minnesota, Gary, okay. their faculty and their administrators contribute two and a half percent to their retirement, the University of Minnesota matches that with 13 percent. That's not responsible. The kids shouldn't have to pay for that. The, okay. the, uh, your, our higher education institutions okay. need to get their own books. Your question for uh, Tom Emmer, your question for Tom Horner, please. Mr. Horner, you've, uh, you've suggested you're going to hold uh, LGA harmless, you're going to hold education harmless, and when I say harmless, you want it to grow, uh, government grow by almost 20% in the next two years, beyond the 7 to 8% new income uh, revenue that we're going to have. My question to you is, if you're going to hold 85% of what government wants to grow at harmless, and you have a $2.5 billion hole in your budget, what other taxes are you going to raise, or are you going to cut veteran services, agriculture, what are you going to have to cut to meet that two and a half billion dollar hole that is in your budget? Well, and I think, Representative Emmer, that's the kind of question that comes from a person who can only think about government in one way, who can only reflect on what government has done the last six years that you've been in the legislature. If you think about government differently, if you really take a look at my budget proposal instead of how you've characterized it, what you would see are some creative proposals to really change how we're going to deliver human services. When we have, in many counties, social workers who spend 40% of their time not serving their clients, but filling out paperwork that the state has imposed, you as the legislator and other legislators, the governor, that the state has imposed. When you see in many counties around the state, 40% of property taxes going to pay for unfunded state mandates, to say that I'm going to, to increase spending by that much just reflects an inability on your part, I think, to see beyond the budget as just a dollars and cents kind of, of document. And that's why next year, Minnesota will have a $6 billion shortfall. Because you refuse to deal honestly with a $3 billion shortfall in, in 2010. That's what we need to get past. That's what I'm offering as governor. Okay. 
Uh, Tom Horner, your question for Mark Dayton, please. Well, M M Mark, you've staked your entire c uh, campaign really on a, a, a single point tax the rich, which is at the very far left of, of your own party. And then you've stood by silently while special interest groups have come in to spend millions of dollars to, uh, to further divide the state. So my question is that in a career in which you've run for office for 35 years, really on the most partisan of platforms, continue that this year, it's really little surprise that you found yourself isolated in those offices and not very effective, frankly. So if you're elected, how can you guarantee that the two-thirds of Minnesotans who aren't going to vote for you will have your ear and that you will have their ear? Well, uh, Mr. Horner, I, you know, if I'm elected, we'll uh, serve all of Minnesota, as I have done if, when in the other office to which I've been elected. And I have said that if I'm elected, I will make every decision with uh, one consideration. What is who I believe in my heart and in my soul is the best for the most people of Minnesota. That's the commitment I would make as governor. I, I believe that's the commitment either of you would make as governor. You know, we have our different points of view on, on how best to achieve that, but I certainly respect your commitment to that process. I respect Representative Emmer's, and I would just say again that I will make those decisions with what I believe is best for the future of Minnesota. Let's uh, shift gears here just a little bit. Let's take the other round of, of uh, candidate questions right away, and we'll get back to audience questions here, if, if we may. Tom Emery, your question for Mark Dayton. Uh, Senator Dayton, you have proposed a budget that has almost a billion dollar uh, shortfall. It's actually your second attempt. Uh, and you've acknowledged that it's uh, almost $900 million short, so just shy of a billion dollars. Well, at the same time, you're promising, uh, and I know you call them goals, but uh, we've been in several debates, and we've been with you as you promise all kinds of new education spending, as well as promising to increase education spending every year. Uh, we've listened to you talk about uh, your tax plan. What other taxes are you going to raise? Uh, and uh, please uh, address the, uh, the income tax as well. Are you going to go beyond the 11% that you've promised to raise income tax? taxes to in this state. Uh, what other taxes are you going to raise to try and meet the, uh, not only the spending promises you're making, but the billion dollar hole that you've got in your budget? Well, Representative Emmer, uh, you know, as I've said, I will not uh, raise the income tax rate uh, above the highest, which is 11%, and the top I would raise it to is 10.95%. But going back to your not, not, not answering my earlier question, I do believe that people making a million or five or ten million dollars a year should buy a higher income tax rate than people making seventy-five thousand dollars a year, as is the case in Minnesota today. I believe in progressive income taxes. I think those that are most successful, and I, I, I applaud them for their success, should be paying a share of their taxes that, that they're not today in state and local. Whereas you, with your budget, will increase property taxes on middle-income taxpayers. The Minnesota Department of Revenue, we've agreed as our arbiter, says the property tax falls five times more heavily on middle income taxpayers than it does on the upper income taxpayers. And as I've said clearly and repeatedly in this response to these debates, the $890 million that remains in my budget, if I can't find those savings, and I think I'll find hundreds of millions of dollars by going in with the management consultants, but I, I can't put a number on that. That's what they've told me they've achieved with Republican and Democratic governors in other states. Whatever I can't, I will have to delay some repayment of the shift. I would like to repay the shift because I believe within increasing the state commitment to education, squaring our accounts financially with the schools, then okay. increasing funding for early childhood education and for optional all-day kindergarten, those are goals. But they're goals that I believe are better for Minnesota school children than allowing the wealthiest okay. people to avoid paying their fair share of taxes, as you would. Okay. Tom Horner, uh, your question for Tom Emmer, please. Well, because I think this whole issue of how are we going to engage the public, how are we going to unite the public, how are we going to bring Minnesotans together around a common purpose really is so important, whether you talk about jobs or restoring trust in, in our government, that I want to ask Representative Emmer a variation on the same question that, that I asked Senator Dayton. In the same way that, that Senator Dayton has staked his campaign on a simplistic slogan so far to the left, you've staked your campaign on a single bumper sticker slogan to the right of just cut spending. And yet you've earned a reputation in the legislature as a person may be fairly described as more intense about politics than policy. I mean, even members of your own party have complained about the harshness of, of your attacks on them. So my question to you is the same question. If you're elected, how can you guarantee the two-thirds of Minnesotans who won't be voting for you 
that you will listen to them or that they will listen to you. Well, and I appreciate that, Tom. You and I have just gotten to know each other through this process, so I'm not so sure where you get your information. I have great relationships with both Republicans and Democrats in the Minnesota House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, more importantly, I have uh, great relationships with people out on Main Street. And I don't know where somebody comes out and says uh, it becomes extreme or it's to the right because you suggest that people should live within their means, that uh, making sure you don't spend more than you have. I don't know when that became an extreme position. And I think you'll find, if you were traveling with me, that Minnesota agrees with us when we talk about uh, living within our means. And stop taxing us so much that you're driving jobs out of the state of Minnesota. And Senator Dayton, I have to tell you, you keep talking about taxing the rich, but you're not doing that. You know, and I don't know how to be uh, anything but respectful uh, and direct when I tell you, if you were talking about taxing the rich, you'd be talking about taxing your trust accounts in South Dakota. You're talking about taxing, you're talking about taxing income generators, income earners, people that are growing okay. businesses in this state. That's going to drive jobs away from the the state of Minnesota. It's going to kill the entrepreneurial okay. spirit. That's what we got to watch. Mark, please. Mark Dayton, a question for Tom Horner. Mr. Horner, you've talked to your uh, tax proposal about uh, extending the sales tax to clothing and then to personal services. Uh, you, you've been unwilling to specify which personal services uh, you would uh, tax. Would you please do so before uh, people vote on Tuesday? Which specifically personal services are you going to extend the sales tax to include? Sure. Well, good question, Senator Dayton. Thank you for that. Um, and I know that at one point in, in your past political history, you agreed with the need to, to expend, extend the, the sales tax effect last time you ran for governor, you proposed a broader expansion of the sales tax uh, on business. I've gotten older and wiser since then. You, well, uh, you, you like to say that. I know that. I know that, but what really happened, Senator, is that the people you were running against in the primary, Senator Bach proposed a sales tax expansion. R.T. Ryback, the mayor of Minneapolis, proposed a sales tax expansion. Speaker Kelleher opposed your tax plan. I don't think you got wiser. I think you just stayed as political as you've always been. So, so uh, let, let, me answer, let me answer your question, you. because it, 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 it is a good question. You know, what I'm going to do is, um, and I've been very bold and very forthright about it, that I think we do need to lower the sales tax by a full percent. We need tax reform. We have too many people in Minnesota who pay no income tax at all, and when that happens, there's a disconnect between the cost of government and, and what we pay. We need to have everybody have a shared responsibility in reducing the cost of government. And the way we do that is to expand the, the, the sales tax, to go to more of a consumption tax. We need to stop okay. taxing investment and production. We need to start looking at more reliance on consumption. All right. Back, back to the audience. Larissa Anderson, please. Gary, Gary, I'm here with Steve McEwen from Richfield. He's got a question about jobs. Yes, I keep hearing about job creation, but really nothing concrete throughout the whole campaign, I must say. What can any of you do, what actions can any of you do that can top, come January, the 21,000 jobs that would be created by signing on to the federal health care uh, bill? Tom Emmer? <laughs> well, Stephen, first, uh, I, I disagree with your premise that you believe that we're going to create 21,000 new jobs with the federal health care uh, legislation. In fact, you may create uh, as many as 160 or 165 new bureaucracies, uh, which, if you think about it, Economics 101, that's going to suck even more resources out of our private economy for to try and support something that, frankly, is not sustainable and it's really not responsible. I would suggest that if you go to our website, emmerforgovernor.com, you will see a very specific proposal. How do you create jobs? Government doesn't create jobs. Government actually creates the environment that allows entrepreneurs to thrive. That's who cre creates jobs. What you got to do, two things in the state of Minnesota. We don't need to be the cheapest place to do business in the, in the country or in the world. We have the greatest workforce still. We just need to make sure we're competitive. And that comes from lowering taxes, streamlining regulation, so that we can allow the entrepreneurs in this state to start to thrive again. That's how you'll grow jobs. And we have pro uh, provided a complete and detailed plan how to do that in immediately in the next two years. Mark Dayton. 
It's just it's such a common sense decision for the next governor, as I would on the day one, sign uh, the early opt-in to Medicaid, which would bring about $1.4 billion in additional federal funding for Minnesota. It would create, uh, I've seen the study, uh, over 20,000 new jobs or save existing jobs in our health care system. It would provide better quality health care to over 100,000 Minnesotans. And very importantly, it would provide financial stability to Minnesota hospitals, particularly those in greater Minnesota, that many of which are hard-pressed financially today. So absolutely, I would sign on day one the early opt-in to Medicaid. Tom Horner. Well, I think the question was about job creation, Senator, um, and I can't imagine that there is a sharper, clearer distinction among the three of us than on job creation. Because, Representative Emmer, when you decide to cut spending, when you voted against the, the bonding bills that you have, there goes the Biomedical Discovery uh, District at the University of Minnesota. That's where we're going to create the next Bedtronic, the next St. Jude's. That's where we're going to get our innovation. But, Senator, your tax plan, you would tax the small businesses, raise their taxes by 30 to 40 percent on state income taxes, the companies that have 90 percent of the small business jobs in Minnesota. They can't sustain that. They can't afford that. So we need to do a couple of things. One is that we should have a $400 million bonding bill next year for, for shovel-ready projects, get people back to work immediately then fix the economic infrastructure of Minnesota, streamline the regulatory process, do the kind of health reforms that I'm proposing to make sure we keep the cost of doing business in Minnesota lower, keep investing in education, particularly our great two-year schools that are so important to local regional economic assets, invest in research, and make sure that we are a state that is always competing on the basis of our great talent pool, because that always will be our competitive advantage. Back to the uh, audience, Curtis Gilbert, please. Yes, uh, Gary, I am here with Bob, and he lives in Rockford. He hasn't decided who to support for governor. He's torn between um, Tom Horner and Tom Emmer, uh, and he has a question for all three candidates. It's been known for years that ev after every census, we redraw our political uh, boundaries, our districts. The term has been called gerrymandering, where the party in power will typically use their power to solidify their power. And it seems to be uh, acknowledged that this causes a lot of uh, problems in creating extremely liberal, extremely conservative districts that then become polarized. And it's been acknowledged to be a lot of the polarization that we see in our country as well as in our state with this kind of districting. Can I ask each of the candidates to comment on how you feel gerrymandering, and can I ask you for a commitment that if you're the winner, that you would do everything in your power to not let that pollute our political atmosphere for the future? Tom Horner? Yes. Well, Bob, that's a great question, and I agree with you. I think that the one area in the next four years, the most important political reform that where the governor will have an absolutely guaranteed role is in managing redistricting. And if we don't create more competitive legislative districts, there's no reason to expect that we will have Democrats willing to take risk if they're always in safe districts, or Republicans willing to take risk. We will have a continuation of the gridlock. So here's what I've promised, and I'm the only one who can make this promise, is that we will get it out of the political world. We will move redistricting to an independent commission, as has been recommended by some former governors, by experts who have looked at it, and we will do it in a way that reflects the best interests of Minnesotans, competitive, balanced legislative districts, not Democratic districts, not Republican districts, Minnesota districts. Mark Dayton. I believe the last uh, three uh, redistricting have by uh, default gone to the judicial panels in Minnesota. And I absolutely agree that that's uh, where it ought to be uh, done either by a uh, independent commission or by a, an independent judicial panel, both in reality and perception, we should take the politics out of it, and it should be done uh, to assure the integrity of, of the representation in Minnesota, as well as to assure Minnesotans the, the integrity of our, of our, our electoral process. Tom Emmer. Bob, what I would tell you is that if I'm in the governor's office, uh, it will be fair. Absolutely. I know, um, I know you 
gentlemen have spent uh, all of these debates, almost all of the debates, talking about the budget issue, and appropriately so, it's the big one, but back to those social issues, which I know, Mr. Emery, you'd rather not talk about, and, and, you've, and it just hasn't come up often, but there are folks who are really interested in where you're going to stand on, the so, on these social issues, and uh, let me start with you, Tom Emmer, if I may. Will you back tighter restrictions on abortions in the state of Minnesota? You know what, Gary? I've never uh, said I won't talk about it. What I've said is, you know, I'm the only pro-life candidate up here, but that's not an issue. No, that, that is right. not an issue. What I have said regularly, every time these issues are brought up, Gary, is we've got to talk about the things that unite us. Well, these, we have these been, issues, you know, but we have been talking about that, and, and I think it's fair to say, if you're elected governor, uh, would, you, would you support push for tighter restrictions? I don't think it is at this point, Gary. I think what we're talking about in this state is jobs and the economy. And if we keep focusing or trying to distract our attention to things that just slow us down and divide us, we're not going to do the things that we have to up front, Gary. This election, well, the next Well, if the governor, legislature sends you a bill which would tighten restrictions or re relax restrictions on abortion, would you sign it or veto it? I, I, I answer the question. I've got a very clear record on where I stand when it comes to pro-life. I'm going to be a jobs and economy guy if I'm elected to the, uh, to the governor's office. Uh, Mark Dayton, um, would, you, uh, would you actively push for civil unions or legalization of same-sex marriage if you're elected? I believe in marriage equality, and I w believe that under the founding principles of this country, that all men and women are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That certainly should include the right of, of every Minnesotan to marry the man or woman he or she loves. So you, I would, yeah. uh, yes, I would support it, and I would promote it, and I would sign it. Tom Horner, would you actively push for either civil unions, same-sex marriage uh, provisions? Hey, you know, for the last several years, both in my, my community service career as well as my professional career, I've worked for a terrific organization called Project 515 that works to eliminate the discrimination that are inherent in some of the statutes in Minnesota. Uh, everything from making sure that same-sex families can get discounted fishing licenses the way, same way as, as um, other families, all the way to more important decisions like end of life. I think we need to continue working in that area, but I also will advocate for uh, marriage equality because I do think that we ought to have a, a society, a state that embraces diversity, that respects equality. Lots of talk uh, during the course of the campaign about health care costs. Clearly, uh, it, the costs are going up so dramatically. Should the uh, Minnesota Care Program uh, set up as a kind of safety net program for the working poor. Should that be scrapped? Uh, Mark Dayton? It should not be scrapped, no. And the, one of the reasons the early opt-in for Medicaid is so important because it will relieve the financial pressure on, on Minnesota Care, by, which has resulted from the governor decimating uh, GMC and, and shifting uh, some of those uh, clients to uh, Minnesota Care and, and threatening the financial stability there. So, but no, it plays a very important role in providing health insurance for those uh, Minnesotans who uh, otherwise would go without health care. And we go to our emergency rooms, require more expensive care. So it benefits uh, them and it benefits our broader society because uh, it relieves that pressure on our emergency rooms so they can provide affordable care for those who really need it. Tom Horner. Well, I don't think it should be scrapped, but I also don't agree that we can just take the status quo and make it a lot bigger. The cost of public health programs is unsustainable, and we do need to, to get a hold of it while we improve quality. And so I think there are a couple of things. One, I do agree that we ought to take the early opt-in to Medicaid, not because we get federal dollars, but because we can expand coverage, and we won't get to real reform if we don't expand coverage. But secondly, look at Minnesota, the state, the government, is the largest purchaser of health care in, in the state for its employees, for public health programs. And we have yet to use that purchasing power with this governor, with this legislature, under Senator Dayton's proposal. We have yet to use that purchasing power to really figure out how do we redesign health care? How do we drive some of these efficiencies? How do we hold people accountable for their own behavior? How do we improve prevention? I'm the only one who has laid out specific programs to do that. Now, they're going to Take, taking on some of the special interest in Minnesota, but we better do it. If we want to lower the cost and improve quality and expand coverage for Minnesotans, then we need to take on some of these challenges and take them on realistically. Tom Emmer. Uh, 
Senator Dayton, I would tell you, I don't think turning over our uh, health care system to the federal government is a, it, it's not leadership for Minnesotans and it's not a good idea for the long term. This uh, early opt-in that you suggest is going to solve some of the issues with Minnesota Care, frankly, is the, the wrong answer. It's, it's actually going to make it worse if you uh, opt in to uh, early MA. Think about it. You know, it, we've got 11 states that were given the opportunity to do this early opt-in, only two accepted the offer and they still have yet to get any money there's no guarantee the federal government's going to come through with any of this when you talk about Minnesota care Gary Minnesota care needs to be reformed all public programs uh, need to be reformed they need to be more individual based not more government based they need to be more individual based and I, pre I uh, presented a bill in the legislature which would turn Minnesota care from the program that it is right now a turnkey if you will government insurance program where somebody comes in looking for this health care safety net and they're absorbed into the government system their claims are administered by government employees etc the reform is more individual based let's give them the same benefit but with a private health care premium voucher where they can go participate in the middle class uh, uh, with the middle class for their health care insurance just like everybody else in Minnesota back to the audience Nancy Liebens please uh, Gary Gary, I'm here with Marsha from Maplewood. Um, she's deaf, and her question will be interpreted by Heather. When the ADA was passed in 1990, only 22% of people with disabilities were employed. Now, 20 years later, in 2010, that number has not increased. What will you do as governors to develop your jobs program for the state to end the discrimination and increase the number of people with disabilities who are hired. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Mark Dayton, why don't you go first, please? I'll start uh, by leading with example in my administration hiring people with disabilities because I agree with you that's shameful that that uh, percent has not increased and I will encourage uh, private employers throughout Minnesota to follow my leadership and my example and hire people with disabilities because I know they're incredibly talented people who have many contributions to make throughout our society. Tom Emmer. Well, I serve uh, in the legislature with uh, Representative Tory Westrom from Elbow Lake, Minnesota, and he's legally blind. Uh, it, it, to me, we have laws right now, Marcia, that deal with discriminating against uh, anyone uh, based on their, uh, their physical condition. Uh, age, physical condition. We need to enforce the laws that we have, and the most important thing we can do is start to grow jobs in this state so that there are more jobs that can fill, that can be filled by people from every walk of life, including those that uh, have to deal with physical disabilities. Tom Horner. But you know, with, with, with all due respect to, to Representative Emmer, I mean, that's the same kind of answer as the one you just gave on health care. Look, it's great to say we're going to give vouchers for everybody. It's great to say that you're going to give vouchers for health care to everybody, but if the cost of health care is too expensive, if you, look at my wife is, as, as you know, Tom, I mean, my wife is, is a cancer survivor. If I don't win on Tuesday, we don't have health insurance, we're going to have a tough time buying it in the private marketplace. That's the reality, whether I have a voucher or not. And so with the, the disabled workers, here's the reality, is that we have cut important support services for the disabled, including personal care attendants. We need to make sure that we're creating the opportunity for all people to succeed, for all people to have the opportunity for Minnesota to be a hospitable state for everyone, regardless of their ability. We don't have uh, much time left, but I wanted to ask you, you gentlemen have been uh, part of a really unique uh, political experiment, social experiment, 26 debates. Uh, is this a good way for future statewide candidates, Senate, Governor, to conduct their campaigns? Do you think this is a good way for the state to operate uh, politically? Tom Emmer? In terms, Gary, of the debates? We yeah. Have? Now that the next ones, should they be expected to run 26 debates? Well, I would never say that uh, things should, because it works this time, that's the way you do it next time. You should always be looking uh, at the circumstances that present themselves uh, at the time you're talking about. But today, for somebody like me, this has been fantastic. I mean, I'm a guy from Delano, Minnesota that's raising this great family and trying to run a small business that nobody, uh, almost nobody had heard of just 16 months ago.
this has given me the opportunity with these uh, uh, two fine men to introduce myself to uh, Minnesotans all over uh, the state. It's been a great opportunity, I think. Mark Dayton. Gary, I think it's been terrific for Minnesota. I think it uh, says so much uh, positive about Minnesotans' uh, interest in this uh, election and our the participation in, in the election process, which has always been one of the very best of any state in the nation. It's a great antidote for 30-second sound bite, 30 30-second commercials and, and seven-second sound bites, and it's given people all over Minnesota a chance to see us firsthand and, and to hear from us directly. Tom Horner? Yeah, you know, for, for me, again, I mean, I can't compete with the millions of dollars they've been able to spend out of their own pocket, their special interest groups. So for me, the forum has been terrific. The one change I'd recommend is that we do more of these debates in communities around the state and really get out, because part of the value is interacting with a live audience, dealing with the people. We ought to be part of Greater Minnesota more than we have through the 26 debates we've done. Okay, before we wrap up, I wanted to give each of the candidates 30 seconds here to make a final pitch for your vote. Candidates Drew Straws, Tom Horner goes first. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great honor to run for governor. Here's the question that I hope you ask yourselves as you vote on Tuesday. Why is it that all of those who follow the election most closely, most of the newspapers around the state, local newspapers, former governors, the local officials who have endorsed me, all have come out and said, I'm the one person who can bring Minnesota together, who can create jobs, who can build a future. And so I'd ask you this. Vote your conscience. Go into the polls knowing that a vote for Tom Horner is a vote for Tom Horner and the people of Minnesota. Thank All right, you. Independence Party candidate Tom Horner. Next up, Republican Tom Emmer. I also want to say thank you to all of you that are here today. Thanks to Public Radio, Gary, uh, to my colleagues for doing this. There are three people running there, two messages. Uh, these two gentlemen believe you've got to raise billions of dollars of taxes yet again to grow government beyond its means. I think it's time for government to live within the revenue it has and start to grow jobs. I am the only candidate that will not raise taxes on middle class Minnesotans or any other Minnesotan for that matter. Appreciate your support. That's Republican Tom Emmer. And uh, finally, uh, Democrat Mark Dayton. I want to thank you, the people of Minnesota, for considering my candidacy, and I want to respectfully ask you for your support next Tuesday. I will be the jobs governor for Minnesota based on my experience as commissioner of economic development twice for this state. I will go anywhere in this state, nation, or world with our jobs to be gained for Minnesota. I will make taxes fair, and I will invest that money in education so we give every one of our children a chance to be successful in the global economy. The theme of my campaign is a better Minnesota, and if you entrust me with the office of governor, I will work every day and every night to create a better state for all of us. Thank you. Gentlemen, thanks so much. That's all the time we have this afternoon. Thanks to all the candidates for joining us and good luck on Tuesday.